Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, a very special, very, very special, it's always special, but it's very special mm -hmm. today, a very special interview on Mormon Stories podcast. It's November 1st, 2017. I hope you all had a wonderful Halloween for those of you who celebrated it. And I uh, am just jumping out of my metaphorical mm -hmm. chair uh, with excitement to have on Mormon Stories uh, one of the first non-Mormons ever. Now we have had a few non-Mormons. If any of you remember, we once did the three interfaith amigos uh, where we had a rabbi along with a, um, an imam and a, uh, a priest, which sounds like a joke, but uh, we have had a few non-Mormons in the past. But today we are going to be having uh, acclaimed author Tova Mirvis. Uh, this is her most recent memoir. It's her book. It's entitled The Book of Separation. Um, it's an amazing, incredibly relevant uh, memoir about her experience as an Orthodox Jew, uh, marrying an Orthodox Jew, but then losing her faith and what that did to her marriage, being in a mixed faith marriage as an Orthodox uh, Jew, and then eventually losing her faith and um, having to end the marriage. Uh, I, I'll just give you a small sampling of what my experience with this book has been like so far. Here is a page, uh, if you guys can see it, here's a page in the book, and it shows you how relevant the book uh, is for me. Um, that's just one sample of the page, but I think uh, liberal, progressive, and post-Mormons are gonna find this book incredibly relevant. And today we're gonna to talk to Tova about her story. Um, and we're not gonna cover the book uh, fully intentionally because what we're gonna do is kick off uh, a new round of Mormon Stories Book Club. We're gonna invite everyone to read this amazing book. And then like in a month, we're gonna to have Tova back and we're gonna dig into the book in depth. Um, but this interview is to capture her story, capture a lot of background. Um, and then uh, and then talk about it in a month. So go right now, right now, go buy this book, start reading it, and in a month, you can participate with us. And we hope to bring Tova to Salt Lake City uh, to do a live interview with her. So before we actually jump into this interview, I just have a few very quick announcements. Um, I think we want to make sure everyone understands that we've opened a new Patreon account. So if you are not a Mormon Stories donor right now, uh, you have a couple options of ways to donate. You can go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button. You can pick 10, 25, 100 bucks a month, whatever works for you. And uh, you can donate that way by becoming a recurring donor. We're gonna have you join uh, a, a private Facebook group called Open Stories Foundation Donors, where we're gonna uh, do lots of cool special things. But most importantly, you get to support the Open Stories Foundation and its mission to support uh, people experiencing a religious faith transition um, and those impacted by that transition. But we also opened up a Patreon account. Uh, you just pay a dollar per interview. Uh, it's, it's a low barrier to entry and you can go to patreon.com slash Mormon stories and join there. Um, and either way, what we're going to do now is we're going to release our interviews early for donors just to give them a little bit of a special um, experience. So again, if you're already a Mormon Stories donor, uh, over the past, let's just say 12 months, you can go to Open Stories Foundation, Facebook, uh, Open Stories Foundation donors, Facebook group, join that group, and we're going to have some special things for you there. Or you can join Patreon slash Mormon Stories, and we'll get you early versions of the interviews there. We're just releasing the Mike, D. Michael Quinn interview today um, in this way, uh, and we just released the Mike Norton interview last week, and so lots of cool things coming up. Really quickly, we do have a few events coming up. Uh, the next Mormon Stories workshop will be in San Francisco, November 9th through 10th. Uh, we just had an amazing workshop in Lehigh, Utah, uh, rated 4.9 out of 5. People said it was really uh, useful to them. So if you want to be a part of uh, the Mormon Stories workshop experience in San Francisco, join us November 9th through 10th. We're also going to have a full day uh, Mormon Stories workshop November 17th, again in Utah County and Lehigh. Uh, people are saying it's really useful in helping them navigate their, um, their faith crisis, navigating their mixed faith marriages, helping them communicate with believing family and friends, helping them raise kids who are unorthodox or post-Mormon. 
um, so many uh, you know useful things come out of these workshops and retreats. So please uh, join us. And of course, the Mormon Stories Cruise is next fall, 2018. You can go to register for all these events at mormonstories.org slash events. Um, so those are the announcements for today. And uh, without any further ado, I want to introduce to you Tova Mirvis. Tova, thank you so much for joining us all the way from, uh, are you in Massachusetts? I am in Newton, Massachusetts, right outside of Boston. Yeah, it is such a thrill to have you on Mormon Stories. Um, thank you. I'm going to read the little blurb in your book. It sure. says, to Tova Mirvis is the author of three novels, Visible City, The Outside World, and The Ladies Auxiliary, a national bestseller. Her essays have appeared in various publications, including the New York Times, the Boston Globe Magazine, and Poets and Writers, and her fiction has been broadcast on NPR. She lives in Newton, Massachusetts, at tovamirvis.com. Uh, what's it like to be on a Mormon-themed podcast, Tova? Well, it's, you know, it's two things at once. On one hand, it's, it's so funny. It feels like I grew up so steeped in an Orthodox Jewish world where that was the entire world. And so on one hand, it feels very far away. And yet one of the things I've learned, I think, through writing about religion is how close some of our communities are. And I think especially with Mormon communities, I've heard so many times that there's there's such a sense of commonality in what it is to grow up in in my community and in your community. Yeah. Have you ever had uh, Mormons reach out to you about your books that you are that you're aware of? Do you have any Mormon friends? I have. You know, it's funny. I just this past week, two people on Facebook who are both former Orthodox Jews told me that the way they found out about my book was that a formerly Mormon friend told them to read it. And so, you know, I've heard over the years that I think people in the Mormon community read The Ladies Auxiliary, which is about the Orthodox community in Memphis where I grew up and is very much about social propriety and what it means to be an insider and an outsider. And I actually, I had a, a very close Mormon friend in college. I, my, one of my roommates um, by chance was Mormon and I was in a room with m myself and another woman who was an Orthodox Jew. And I, we, at that time, I think I had that first moment of realizing that people who come from strict religious communities share a lot in common. Even if the particulars differ, I felt like we were really coming from a, the same world and navigating at the same time the question of what it means to be in the larger outside secular world for the first time. Yeah, yeah. Have you by chance been following the Leah Remini um, series uh, about Scientology? No, I haven't. Have you heard about it? No, tell me. Oh no no! She, it's okay. just a it's a series on on her experiences as a Scientologist and interviewing other Scientologists. And honestly, what came to my mind just now is: is it even offensive? Would it be offensive for you for me to even invoke Scientology as we talk about Orthodox no. Judaism? I'm not easily offended. Don't worry, I'm okay. good. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. So I want to just dig right in, and but before we actually get to your story. Uh, I, I guess, number one, I want to thank all of our live mm -hmm. listeners who are joining us on Mormon Stories Live. Uh, lots of cool friends are already there, and we want to encourage our listeners to post questions and comments there because that makes these interviews more interesting. We're going to try and do a three-hour interview, maybe a two-and-a-half-hour interview, uh, as long as we can. Toby, you just need to tell us when, like, you've got five or ten minutes left because, okay, sure. as, as my listeners know, we can go for several hours. Okay, sure. Um, so... So before we actually dive into your story, I'm going to ask you to do something that you may not feel prepared to do, which is to give us um, give us a little bit of background on Judaism. And let me let me set it up if that's okay. Sure. So for I've been in love with Judaism for a long time, and let me tell you why. When I was in college, I read a book by an author named Kaim Potok mm -hmm. called sure. "My Name Is Asher Lev." I love that book. And okay, so you've read it. You know who Kaim Potok love is. Love it. Yes. Okay. So Kaim Potok. Uh, introduced me to this idea that there isn't just a monolithic Judaism, which at the right. time I would have not known. Um, and then I went on to read The Chosen, The Promise, and Davida's Harp, in mm -hmm. addition to My Name is Asher Lev. And this was like 13, 14 years ago, right as I was experiencing my Mormon faith crisis. And what was really powerful for me was just this idea that once upon a time, maybe there was sort of there probably never was monolithic Judaism, but right. maybe there was more monolithic Judaism at one point. But then at some point, um, maybe after World War II and the Holocaust, and it even started in the 19th century, Jews started sort of confronting modernity and realizing mm -hmm. that a lot of 
let's just say ultra orthodox sort of um, thoughts and and beliefs and maybe even behaviors didn't didn't fit with modernity, and so there started becoming these branches of Judaism. So, uh, and I just love that. So, can you talk us through a little bit about? Uh, you know, the different branches of Judaism today and just a tiny bit about their history to the extent that you know it so that we can know where your upbringing fit in the broader spectrum of Judaism. Sure. When, you know, people talk about belonging to the Jewish community or being Jewish, it really spans a very wide range of practice and belief. And so Orthodox Judaism believes in the idea that the Torah, the five books of Moses, are given by God written by God and given by God to Moses. And in addition to that written law, there is an oral law that was also given by God to Moses. And that law wasn't written down for many centuries, but was passed down you know, from, you know, by word of mouth, essentially, and eventually was codified into the Talmud. And the Talmud became the basis for Jewish law. And the Talmud is a series of interpretations. And each generation built upon those laws, asking questions about, you know, the the Bible says to observe the Sabbath. Well, what does that mean? How do we observe it? And then rabbinic law or the oral law steps in to define those categories. And so I think what really defines Orthodox Judaism is a belief in the divinity of that law. So that even the rabbinic laws, the, the sort of the question of, can you do this or not do this? Even those are, are believed to be divine. And Orthodox Judaism, I think there's never been monolithic Judaism, but that was sort of normative Judaism for many years. And then as, as history moved forward and the Jewish world confronted modernity, there became a, you know, you know really what you're describing, a sense of how do you meet traditional religious ideas with the concept of modernity and outside philosophy. And in response to that, there was a, um, it was called the Haskalah, the enlightenment period, where people began to question the notions of these beliefs in the divinity of the Torah and the oral law. And there was sort of a, the creation of a secular Judaism. I'm, I'm going to sort of skim over a lot, you know, Jewish history is so vast. But wait, wait, has, what, what century was that? Or what decade about the Haskalah? Um, I'm tempted to Google it because I don't want to get it wrong. But like I believe 19th it was 18, century, 20? I think um, 18th or 19th century. Okay, okay, um, and that's I, I, fine. I, I could be wrong, so I want to just um, qualify that. But yeah. um, but I think um, you know, was it even, happening in Germany? Was it happening in New York? Do you, do you have a um, sense? It was European. It was European based, um, not in New York yet. You know, the, um, the, the um, but there were always Jews who deviated. Let's say Spinoza in the 17th century was a philosopher who was a of Jewish upbringing who became, who was actually excommunicated for his non-belief and for his radical ideas at that time. So I think there's all, that, the notion that there's always been one way to be and that, that we all do it is of course never true in any kind of historical, historical um, community because, you know, whenever you have lots of people, you're always going to have a divergence of belief. And even within Judaism, even within Orthodox Judaism, there's a great division, um, you know, to, um, Maybe I'll, from Orthodox Judaism. Well, well oh, let sorry. me just, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. I, I went ahead and Googled it. It looks okay. like it's 18th and 19th century, so you okay. were spot on. Okay. It did. It, it is Europe. Um, it, it mentions Moses, my, Mo, Moses Mendelssohn mm-hmm. as uh, somebody who maybe was, a, was an important part of that. Just really quickly, do you have a sense for how the Haskalah uh, evolved into these different branches. And I don't expect any right. super accurate, you're not a historian, right. but just to give us a sense for like, okay, so there was all this this intellectual awakening and enlightenment. Mm-hmm. How did it turn into different branches? Right. So I guess one of, the, one of the questions became, if you no longer believed in the divinity of the law, in the notion that you had a, a God-given obligation to eat this or not eat this, what was your Jewish identity like? Were you, could you still partake of Judaism? And the reform Jewish movement began really in response to this. And, you know, the, true to its name, it was the idea of reforming the early notions of Orthodox Judaism and became a more sec, uh, become less um, sort of traditionally religious. And you caught to, yourself. You didn't want to did. say more secular. You exactly. said Exactly. Why did you, know, you do so, that? Well, tell tell it's me so why. Funny. It's so funny. When I was growing up, I thought, that the word orthodox Jew was synonymous with religious. 
it didn't occur to me. I thought, well, you know, if you're Orthodox, you're religious. It was the same thing. And if you're religious, obviously you're Orthodox. It didn't occur to me until I went to college that you could not be an Orthodox Jew, but still be religious. That I, I mean, It was one of those moments that like shook my whole worldview that, oh, there are other ways to still be religious, but not in the way I was raised. And I think maybe we all have those moments when our small worlds are forced open. And for me, that was one of those. So you heard that, that slip of, you know, that Reformed Judaism is not secular Judaism. It's still a branch of religion, religious Judaism, but it's certainly different than what I grew up with. But it's this idea of rules given from God, and therefore you're obligated to follow them because they are God-given. Was secular then, kind of a bad word growing up? Like Sec secular was just like the other end of the planet. It was just secular Jews were, you know, they weren't even called secular. They were not religious. You know, the, like, oh, I don't think they're religious. So <laughs> how you would sort of refer to someone as it just, I love it. you know, it was far, it. far away. Um, and then, okay. then just to say with the Jewish movements, you know, in response to reform Judaism, conservative Judaism was created. And so it's sort of ironic that, you know, growing up, I was always like, why are they called conservative? Because they seem so far left from orthodoxy, but it was conservative in response to reform that wanted to create sort of a middle ground position um, between these two supposed extremes. Okay, so we've got orthodox on the far right, right? Mm -hmm. Except except not because there's Hasidic, right? Right. Well, so what, you know, maybe this is part of the Jewish world where every world can be subdivided into multiple worlds. Yeah. So with, within orthodox Judaism, there's also a range. Change. And so, you know, if you were just to, to divide it from right wing to left wing or ultra orthodoxy, which would include Hasidic Judaism to modern orthodoxy, which is how I grew up. And I, I think the main difference between ultra orthodoxy and modern orthodoxy is the relationship to the outside world and to the secular world. And so many, or, many ultra orthodox Jews believe in the idea that you have to be separate from the outside world, that reading secular books, going to secular college, participating in any secular activities or communal activities is dangerous, that it threatens your ability to be who you are. And as you move leftward, in the Orthodox world toward modern Orthodoxy, you arrive at the idea that you can be two things at once. You can participate in secular culture, you can go to college, you can read books, and yet still maintain your strict religious identity. And so I was raised in this world with the idea that you were to take what you learned in the secular culture and, and somehow integrate it with your religious identity and that you didn't have to be threatened by going to a secular college, but somehow you could live on this dividing line between these worlds and hold them all together. And of course, because there's always an, you can always subdivide further. You know, one of the things that's been interesting to me in recent years is actually two phenomenon. One is that the modern Orthodox world has moved to the right. There's been an increasing sense of stringencies even in the so-called liberal leaning world. And yet at the same time, there has been a smaller group that I think has become farther to the left, certainly around social issues and women's roles and participation. And that group now calls itself open orthodoxy. And there's of course, multiple tensions and infighting and back and forth about what constitutes authentic Orthodox Judaism. And then where does uh, Reconstruction, is, is it Reconstructionist? There's something else over on the reform side, right? Right. Reconstructionist is, I think, um, another movement, a newer movement. Um, I don't know as much about it. Um, actually, I'm actually very curious and learning more about it. But I think Reconstructionist is an idea of, um, is similar to maybe Jewish renewal, this idea of trying to infuse um, greater sense of spirituality into practice and um, reshaping the, the notion of what it means to be Jewish. So basically making reform l a little more spiritual, but still secular? I think so. Still, I'm not secular. I'm not going to use, I, I've, now that you've called me out, I'm not going to use that word, but more, um, but not um, maybe more consistent or that can speak more to modern sensibilities. Okay. So I should, I should not use the word secular. Is that right? Right. Because there's also secular Judaism, which is the notion that I can participate in Judaism from a cultural perspective. I am part of a, of a history. I'm part of a tradition, but I don't partake of religious rituals. And so that would be secular Judaism. So reformed Jew would not call themselves secular? No, not, necess not necessarily. Okay. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Huh? 
So, so secular Judaism is sort of like atheistic, non-practicing cultural Judaism. I think so. Okay, interesting. All right, so that is fascinating. Um, so my understanding is Reformed Judaism is the largest branch of Judaism in the United States. Is that right? I think so. And then right now, where do you put yourself in the spectrum? Well, it's interesting. You know, for so long, my identity was I'm an Orthodox Jew. I don't think that when you live inside a world that is so, that really shapes every part of you. I don't think that it's just something you practice on Saturdays or something you do sometimes. I think it was the most central fact about me. And when you leave something, I don't think you leave that sense of identity very easily. And so I, you know, I think there's that in-between stage, that place of unbecoming before you can become something else. And so soon after I sort of people started knowing that I was no longer Orthodox, someone asked me, well, are you conservative now? Are you reform? And I was like, no, I'm in this, I'm in this unshaped state. I'm in this sort of desert space between places of not needing to define my Judaism or not being able to. And in some ways, I think maybe that identity that fits me the best is, you know, I used to be Orthodox. It still feels like that identity. And I think we need to honor the space between places and be willing to live in that undefined place for, for a long time. And I think I would still place myself there. Is that li- liminal? Is that the word? Yeah, exactly. That liminal place, right? Keep, Even what's, go ahead. Keep, keep going. Yeah, yeah, that idea that you, can, that you don't have to define it, that in leaving something, you don't have to move towards a new definition that quickly. Okay. So do you, you don't use the term post-Orthodox or ex-Orthodox or anything like that? I mean, those are the terms used. People use, you know, ex-Orthodox, former Orthodox. Um, I guess, you know, ex-Orthodox would probably define it well or formerly Orthodox or still trying not to be who I always was Orthodox. (laughs) You know, there are lots of ways you could describe it. Awesome. Okay. So now we're going to jump in. This was super helpful. Thank you for that overview. I actually learned a lot. Um, so let's talk about your your parents really quick. So sure. do you have a sense for your parental genealogy, kind of, you know, the ancestors, where they came from, and um, just sort of, uh, yeah, just a bit about your, your parents sure. and, and your ancestors? So I'm a sixth generation Memphian, which is not what people expect when they hear that I'm an ortho, you know, as part of an Orthodox Jewish community. But my mother's family went to Memphis in 1873 from Germany. And they went to Memphis because Memphis is on the Mississippi River and it was a trading center. And so they went there and they stayed and they, you know, were, were always part of this this very new at the time Jewish community. And my mother's family originally, um, tracing back through the people who came in 1873 were Jewish, but they were not Orthodox. Uh, my, um, my grandmother um, on this side married my grandfather, who's, whose parents were immigrants from Poland, and they um, got married and she became Orthodox when they got married. My father's family is actually from Hampton, Virginia. And so growing up, my father was always referred to as the northerner in the family, sort of ironically, was viewed as being, you know, at least north of here. And my, um, that side of the family, my great-great-grandparents emigrated to the Baltimore area um, from Grudno, which is part of Poland and Russia and Lithuania areas. And they um, were immigrants. They opened a grocery store. My grandfather was born in America and became a rabbi and moved to Hampton, Virginia, where he was the rabbi of a small synagogue. Okay, so mom's ancestors are from Germany and Poland. I'm curious to hear that they came to the United States, that some of them came to the United States not Orthodox. Do you know anything about that? About why they would have left, uh, you know, more, uh, more Orthodox Judaism and what would have led them out? Do you even know? Um, well, they were part of, they were, the ones who came in 1873 were German, and they were part of a secular Jewish world. I think they probably came for opportunity. I think that, for you know, regardless of whether you're Orthodox or not, there was always the specter and fear of anti-Semitism in Europe, and I think that was probably also part of why they came. Yeah, I just, the idea of, the idea of people having a faith crisis in like the 18th or 19th century, and then... Mm-hmm. And then moving and calling themselves or thinking of themselves Mm -hmm. as less orthodox and more secular. It's just kind of really fascinating to think that these things that Mormons 
and other religious groups are experiencing right now in the 21st century people were dealing with back in the 1700s, right. right? Right, exactly. I think, you know, I certainly grew up with the idea that we are a part of a chain of tradition and every link in that chain is exactly the same. And now there's you and are, are you going to be the one to sever it? But of course, it's always more complicated. You know, when you look at human beings, it's never that everyone is the same and it's never that everyone observed and only you are changing it. I think that even, you know, you think about the biblical book of Job, you know, there are crises of faith all along. And I think anytime you have a religious community, you have the question of faith and whether you believe. And, you know, I think the doubt is, has to be part of any conversation about faith. It's always there as a possibility. And, you know, the idea that, you know, we can look back at history and it's easy to look at it as sort of being uniform. But when you would delve into those individual stories, it, it wasn't like that at all. We have a request from Jerry Lee, one of our dear listeners. She's saying that sometimes your camera's moving when you um, move. So she's saying, can you put it on a table or something? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Moving. You know what? Do you mind walking? You're so, going to take no, a walk. No, not at all. Not at all. We're going to walk to my house. I'm going to keep the screen. I'm going to keep the screen very close to me so you don't see the mess. No, we're I'm loving this. To... We're loving this. Okay. I'm getting a tour. I'm going downstairs. You're right. Um, okay. So as as you're moving, can I can I ask you another question? Sure. Okay. So, so I love this idea that faith crises aren't new, that it's anytime you've had religion, you have people who've been doubting or questioning. And that's totally, uh, that totally makes sense. Although I think we forget that. Okay. And so at some point, your not Orthodox ancestors married into Orthodoxy. And so were both your parents uh, raised Orthodox? My parents were both raised Orthodox. It's interesting, both of my grandmothers became Orthodox when they got married. My father's mother did the same thing. Her husband, my grandfather, was the rabbi of this small town synagogue, and she was living at home, and they met, and she, her family was traditional. They attended the synagogue. They may not have been strictly Orthodox, but when she got married, she became more Orthodox. Okay, so your dad was raised Orthodox and your mom was raised Orthodox. Mm -hmm, they were. Okay. So what, um, do you know where they met and how they met? My parents met in New York City. My father went to Yeshiva University, which is an Orthodox Jewish college. And my mother went to the women's branch of that college it's called Stern College, which was in Midtown Manhattan. And you know, it's one of my favorite stories. My parents tell it a lot, how my father was with a group of friends and they were supposed to go to a movie and they missed the movie. So they went to hang out in the lobby of the girls dorm, which was apparently how people met. And you know, as they joke about it, one of my mother's friends was down there and called up to the room and said, there are boys down here. And so they went down there. And I think they were both Southerners, you know, my father being from Virginia, my mother being from Memphis. And they, they, that is how they met. <laughs> I, there are so many parallels. I'm just thinking that the, the Mormons have our own version of Yeshiva University. It's called Brigham Young University. Mm -hmm. It's in Provo, Utah. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm 100% sure that if if we dug into what it's like to go to Yeshiva University, we'd find so many similarities. It's right. kind of like the exactly. Notre Dame, the Notre Dame, you know, right. um, I don't want to minimize your experience by comparing it to ours. No, but. I, I think there's so many comparisons. I, you know, for me in high school, one of the first times I ever had an awareness that my world was comparable to others was when I read this anthology I, I happened upon in the bookstore called Catholic Girls, and I devoured it. And I was like, oh my God, it's exactly like my world. And of course it was so different, but it just spoke to me that same sense. And I think it's where I really learned that idea that, and it's, it's nice to know that religious communities share a lot or that leaving them or struggling with them, that you have a lot in common, not just with those who struggle from your own world, but from those who struggle from other worlds as well, that you, you know, I think when you're part of a community, one of the pleasures of belonging is you have this sense of community. We all believe this. We are all this way. And when you leave, it's so lonely to feel, you know, am I the only one, you know, to stand in synagogue and look around you and think, am I the only one who, who doubts this? But I think when you realize that people from other communities, other religious faiths share that, you create a different kind of community. You can find a sense of belonging across these lines. I love it. Okay, so your parents meet at Yeshiva University. They're married. Um, anything we should know about their life prior to your being born that would sort of help us understand your story? Well, my parents moved back to Memphis. That was very important to my mother, you know, having grown up there. And my older brother was born. And then my parents 
lived away for two years. And so I was born in Bethesda, Maryland. I was the only one in my entire family born away from Memphis. And then they moved back to Memphis. It felt clear to my mother and I, you know, my father maybe less excitedly or willingly that they were going to live in this community where they were, where my mother was from. So your dad went to med school, right? He did. So he was a physician. Um, was your mom a stay at home mom? She was for some years, and then she went back to school to get a degree as a child librarian, and she worked in different um, capacities, running a teacher resource center and as a storyteller in schools. Okay. So growing up, what were the core beliefs? We'll do beliefs, and then we'll do practices mm -hmm. of your, you know, your experience with, with Orthodox Judaism. Well, I think the central belief, the sort of foundational belief was the idea that God had given us the five books of Moses, the, to the Torah, as we called it, and that this book was written by God, and it was the instruction manual for our lives. It was the, the center. And the idea as well that rabbinic law, the oral law, was also from God, and that these were the rules, and that we were to follow them. And while there could be different interpretations of some of the laws, really the unquestionable truth was that this was, this was God's word and this was who we were and who we were supposed to be. And I think also the idea that this, that we were, um, that this world was to be our center always. We were to remain inside of it and to follow it was really to be good. This is what it meant to be a good person. So um, really quickly, so for Mormons, the Old Testament's got a lot more books than the Pentateuch, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. uh, the five books? Right. So all those other books, um, you know, in the in the Old Testament, Jews would not uh, consider scripture, is that right? Well, the, the, no, I'm sorry, the full Old Testament, um, I should refer to as that. You know, we um, studied most fully the five books of Moses, but the, um, you know, it was called like Torah, Nevi'im, the books of prophets, and Ketuvim, the, the writings. So they were all considered by God, from God. So not just the first five books. Right. That was sort of the, I mean, the, the five books of Moses were considered the, um, the given the to core? Moses at, the, yeah, and given to Moses at Mount Sinai, the five books of Moses. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, what? Numbers? Numbers and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so within those, that's, that's sort of the high level. Now let's go one level deeper. Do, you know, was, was a belief in the afterlife something important? Was there a judgment? Was there you know, an idea of, um, I mean, Mormons have this whole thing with Jesus and a savior and sins. So how did you guys look at things like death, like the afterlife, like sin, like uh, repentance? Talk about your beliefs one level deeper. Okay. Well, so some, I mean, well, what's, what's interesting about Orthodox Judaism is that it's very action-based. And so something like the afterlife, let's say, there are notions of an afterlife. There's a term called olam haba, the world to come. But those weren't really part of the day-to-day -day conversation. Those were, you know, different Jewish sources could debate what that means exactly. There was no clear, single, definitive definition of those. What was much more important was the day-to-day -day practice. And so while, you know, the notion of what, your, what happens to your soul after you die could be debated and uncertain, you know, how to keep a kosher kitchen was central. That there was no debate about, it, and that we knew what to do. And so Judaism was, I think Orthodox Judaism is very much about the here and now and the practical belief systems. And then so, there are, of course, the larger values. So I just, this is so weird, because from a Mormon perspective, Mormon theology is like, the whole purpose of life is to become a god someday in the afterlife. And so what you need to do now is marry in the temple because only Mormon temple marriages get you to become gods in the afterlife. And you need to be super righteous because there'll be this judgment. And then that's what gets you into the super special VIP heaven as, as some jokingly like to refer to it. Um, and so, so much of life right now, even baptism and all these ordinances are your, even the temple ceremony, you learn these signs and tokens mm. and it's all oriented towards helping you get to the right place in heaven. And what you're telling, and, and then all the sin, you're like trying not to sin because you want to be with your family in heaven. And what I'm hearing you say is that that's not, and, and a lot of post-Mormons <laughs> think, well, you can't really have religious observance or even community without this fear of a bad mm. heaven and this promise of a really good heaven. And what I'm hearing you say is, there's a lot of super devout Jews that don't, aren't even really thinking about the afterlife. 
I mean, it's there as this sort of like vague sense. You know, I used to worry as a little girl, like if I did something wrong, was God going to punish me? Maybe I worried more like in the, the here and now, was God going to punish me? But right. the, no, the notion of the afterlife certainly is a concept that exists in Jewish writings and Jewish teachings. And certainly, you know, there's such a vast range of Jewish philosophy on these things. But in terms of how it's lived day to day, that wouldn't be what you wouldn't hear, you know, keep the Sabbath because you're going to pay one day. It was, you know, maybe a little bit, but you know, my experience of it was much more about um, on this earth, how to, how to be a good person or what it meant to be an Orthodox Jew. And there was, I mean, there's certainly a notion of reward and punishment and repentance. And then, you know, I grew up with the idea of God, you know, counting my sins. We used to draw pictures of, in nursery school, the divine scale before the high holidays. And it was this picture of the scale. And on one side, our good deeds were stacked. And on the other side, our bad deeds were stacked. So it was there. I just, I don't feel like it was the central guiding impetus for behavior. I love it. Um, okay, so you talked about keeping kosher in the kitchen. Uh, can you tell us what that means? Sure. You know, kosher for, you know, when you grow up keeping kosher in, in an orthodox way, it's, you know, for me, it's second nature by now, but it's not just, there's sort of the broad notions of kosher, which are certain foods are forbidden. Let's say shellfish and any kind of pig meat is forbidden. Meat would have to be slaughtered in a particular way and meat and milk can't be mixed. So any kind of meat product can't be mixed with dairy product. Like a cheeseburger. That, like a cheeseburger. Exactly. A cheeseburger is, is a no-no unless you use vegan Especially cheese. Especially a bacon cheeseburger. That's a super you're, no-no. <laughs> that, you're, you're as far out as you can go with That's that. That's like um, Jewish mass murder is a bacon cheeseburger. Exactly. Okay, it's funny. It. People always assume, you know, what was your big, you know, rebellion? Did you have a cheeseburger? And I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> so I was like, my big rebellion was I had tofu. Like, you know, not, <laughs> you know, not Is tofu a, not kosher? Well, tofu is kosher, but it wasn't cooked in a kosher pan. And so I feel like these rebellions <laughs> Whoa. But I'm, I know I'm out there. It's sort of the irony that, you know, these small rebellions, you know, from the outside, they're laughable. For, for me at the time, it felt enormous. It felt because part of the laws of kosher are not just this sort of, you know, you can, some people, you know, keep kosher. And what that means is they don't eat shellfish or they don't eat ham or they don't mix meat and milk. And that's sort of, you know, people refer to it as kosher style, maybe. But from an orthodox perspective, keeping kosher means that, you know, everything I buy, every food product has a kosher certification on it. So, you know, if you ever look at your packaging and you, you know, many, many foods have it and you wonder what that little O with a U in it or a circle K, that's a kosher certification. And so I don't, wouldn't buy anything that's not certified kosher. And I wouldn't cook, you know, I would have two sets of dishes. I would have dishes that I cook meat in and dishes I cook milk in. And I would never mix them. I wouldn't use the same sponge to wash the meat dishes as I would to wash the milk dishes. Or I wouldn't cut something with the same knife. And so it's, you know, or or if you keep, keep strictly kosher, you would never eat in a restaurant that was not certified kosher. And so it's really, um, you know, an enormous amount of rules um, that become second nature. But it's not like, oh, I just sort of, I'll only, you know, I won't have the bacon in my salad. It's, it's far more complicated than so that. So your kitchen's like rigidly divided or segmented? Talk it about is. that. And what happens if, oh my gosh, I used the wrong knife. Like, right, exactly. What happens? So people, I mean, if you use the wrong knife, you know, it's funny, growing up, it would always be placed on the top of the oven. It was like put out of use for, you know, and I think, you know, I'm a little fuzzy on this. There are ways you can, it's called kosher, like, you know, you put it in boiling water, ways to, to make something usable again. But certainly, you know, if you messed up, it was a problem. It wasn't like you just said, oh, whatever, you know, no big deal. Like, there was the feeling, because there was the feeling that the laws were from God. And so if I wash the meat pan with the milk sponge, I had done something that was not just wrong in the moment, but it would sort of corrupt my kitchen. And so it had to be separated out. So was that a sin to violate kosher? Is it like a sin? Yeah, I got, you know, it's funny. The term sin wasn't necessarily you. I mean, it was used. It was sort of... Um, What's your equivalent? Yeah. What's your equivalent to the word sin? Um, that it was against law, against Jewish law. It was, you broke the law. Okay, so... But it, sin, sin, sin certainly works. Sin works, but you didn't call it sin. So if you were to confess, is there confession? Is um, there, the, do you go to a rabbi to confess or your parents or? There's no formal confession in that way. I mean, there's um, the concept of the high holidays of repentance, where you can repent for your sins. And, you know, one of the big parts of the high holiday service is a series of listings that you do. It's, you know, 
for the sin I have sinned before you. And there's a, in this prayer book, there's a list, you know, for, for speaking harshly, for wanton eyes, for wayward thoughts. And so people, you know, that's sort of a time of reflection and, and taking stock of one's sin. And I guess there's no external confession, but there's certainly internal guilt and that sense that people, I think, are taught to carry around them, this feeling of, I've done something wrong, or, um, which I think, you know, in a religious community so easily becomes, I'm a bad person. The notion of badness, I think, is um, easily handed out to people, the feeling of, I've done this wrong, you know, I'm bad, I'm bad because of it. What are some of the other key uh, sort of behaviors that define one's orthodoxy in addition to keeping kosher and ways that they can be broken. So I know Sabbath observance is huge. Sabbath observance is huge. I would almost put that as um, central. You know, one of the ways you can describe yourself as an Orthodox Jew is you would say, I'm Shomer Shabbat, which means I observe the Sabbath. And that is sort of a way of saying I'm Orthodox. And so Sabbath observance you know, isn't just that you have a Friday night dinner with your family or you light the candles as women do at sundown, but it's, again, it's, it's, ba- it's a world built of rules, of so many minute rules. And so Sabbath observance, you know, is everything from, I don't cook on the Sabbath. I don't turn on the oven on the Sabbath. I don't turn on a light switch on the Sabbath. I don't carry I- objects from one house to another unless there's something called an Eruv, which is like a rabbinic loophole to create a private domain. I don't use my computer. I don't write with paper. I don't, I mean, you could just go stricter and stricter. I don't open the refrigerator if the light's going to go on. And so Sabbath observance is really just- Don't you tur- turn off the light bulb or something? Exactly. You turn off the light bulb so that the light in the fridge doesn't go on. And, and you, you can't drive your car, right? No, no. Yeah. Your book opens with your anxiety about potentially driving on the Sabbath, right? Right. Right. Driving on the Sabbath for me. You know, if you told me 10 years ago I would drive on the Sabbath, I would think, no, no, no. Not and me. Sabbath is Friday night to Saturday night? Is that right? It is. Yeah. It's 25 hours. Sunday 20, Friday. Five hours. 25 hours. Okay. And what about, like, I hear this, something about elevators in New York City where they like stop right. at... You can't push a button? You can, so you can't use any kind of electricity. So you can have the lights left on, or you can use a timer to turn your lights on or off. But you know, once these rules meet the modern world, you have a question. Well, how do you live in a modern world where what if you live on the 35th floor of your building? And so I, you know, many, many times have walked up, you know, 15 flights of stairs, 20 flights of stairs, you know, going to someone's apartment who lived on a very high floor. But there's also, you know, I don't, I'm curious if you have this in, in Mormonism as well, but there's the rabbinic loophole. There's sort of the way around the law. And, you know, one of them is the idea that of, you know, the Shabbos elevator, where it can be programmed to stop on each floor. And I guess the idea in that is, you know, I can't push the button, but if it's already pushed for me and I don't have to do anything, then I can go in the elevator. And that's used sort of as this, way around the rule. Would there be some Orthodox Jews that are okay riding in a Shabbos elevator and then others that think that that's going too far? Yes, of of course, of course. Yes, (laughs) yes, yes, yes. You could ask that, right, but any question you could give that answer. Like, you know, for any law, there will be people who want to be more strict and people who are more lenient. Mm And then there's varieties of practice depending on community and, and rabbinic opinions people follow. So what do you do if you like, what if you, what do you do, for example, if you don't turn the light bulb off, but then the Sabbath starts and then you want to open the fridge, but the light bulb is going to go on if you do? This is like the central drama of my childhood, (laughs) you know, if this ever happened. Um, So, you know, in a similar like loophole fashion, you can't ask someone to turn on, you know, to, to turn your, open your fridge for you. I can't say, John, you know, my fridge is, I can't open it because I'm a Jew. Could you do it? But I can hint to you. So what I would do is I would say, you know, John, it's such a shame. You know, my, the light in my fridge is on and I can't open it. You know, hmm. And I, I can prompt you hoping you'll say, oh, do you want me to come over and turn that on? And I would be like, if you want to. And so it's sort of this way around, this way of me not directing you to do it, but still getting that fridge open. Wow. And I'm laughing, but, but right. it's, it, was it funny or was it like super stressful? 
Well, it depends what it was. I mean, growing up, you know, it became this joke in my family going up that my mother would go to our neighbor and, you know, the first few times she would hint and say, the microwave is closed and I left the green beans in there and, you know, sort of wait to see. And then eventually she knew, of course, my mother would show up at the door and she would know exactly what she needed her to help her out with. And so it was a way, I guess, of trying to observe the laws, but still, you know, recognizing that sometimes you you needed to have that refrigerator opened. But it was, mm. um, it was, it was just part of the language of childhood and, and this world. It was just one of the things that happened that, you know, knowing that the laws, the laws were binding. They weren't, they weren't fungible and they weren't, some, they weren't negotiable in any way. Certainly, I'm sure people, there might have been many people who would say, you know, no one's looking, I'm just going to open the fridge. But I think, you know, for many people, the laws are not, are not something that you can negotiate with or bend because it's not just about other people watching, but about a notion of God watching. And so when you feel, you know, when you really, you know, for those who believe in it, you know, I think it's a very, probably a powerful experience to feel that God has an opinion about what I do right now. And I can't do this because of a God, God's rule and God's law. And I think when you believe in it, that has a lot of power. Talk, I don't, uh, so I'm, I'm giving people a teaser for this amazing okay. book that everyone needs to go out and buy, The Book of Separation. Talk about the hangnail. I was blown away okay. by the hangnail dilemma that you talk about in this book as a child. Right. When you, when you, when you, I think when childhood is where it's so easy to feel the religious laws written, written on you because it's you know, an age before question for some of us before questioning or before cynicism. And I think in childhood, those rules feel like the rules of a parent or the rules of a teacher. It, be, it feels like they define your world. And I was raised to be a good girl. I was raised to do what I thought. And it was sort of my natural inclination was, you know, I was like the teacher's pet, you know, for, through, through, you know, early elementary school. And I took very seriously what I was taught and I took very seriously the notion of God's eye watching me and judging me and maybe in the same way I wanted to please a parent, I wanted to please God, the sense that I was, I was up for evaluation. And I, you know, it's funny, I have such a clear memory of sitting in synagogue next to my mother and you know, I, to this day, I'm like a nail picker. I'm always like picking at my nails, I'm very fidgety. And my, um, you know, I knew that you weren't allowed to, to bite your nails on the Sabbath because you can't tear things. You can't tear a piece of paper. You can't tear, you know, so tearing your nails would be an example of like, you know, something that was forbidden but I'm fidgety. And so I would always try to like not, you know, play with my nails, not bite them, but it, but it was hard to. And certainly for me, having a hangnail was that feeling of how can I not, you know, pull it off or, you know, I would play with it. And I remember so clearly that dilemma of, you know, wanting, you know, I couldn't pray in synagogue like I was supposed to because I was so distracted by this hangnail. And so on one hand, I wanted to just pull it off, but I knew I wasn't allowed to. Um, my mother always hated when I would bite my nails. She would kind of hold my hand gently. And I knew it was, you know, in this case, it was not just because it was a bad habit, but also because it was forbidden. And I, you know, remember that maybe it was one of the early moments of grappling, not just with the day-to-day. -day. You know, I didn't, didn't grapple with the fact that I wasn't going to have meat and milk together. That was just the way the world looked. But maybe one of those early moments of grappling with, you know, what, what does it mean to believe? You know, in what do I believe? And what do I really think about this? And I felt like I had this, you know, daunting theological quandary that by not ripping off the nail, I couldn't pray because I was completely distracted by it. But if I ripped it off, I would be, you know, breaking the, the laws of the, of the holiday and the Sabbath. And I knew that wasn't allowed. And, you know, I remember this, this it felt to me like an enormous question and it weighed on me. And then finally I ripped it off. And, you know, I think about those moments, you know, maybe sometimes we have lots of moments where we rip off the hangnail and it seems tiny. I mean, it's, it's funny. It's so small of a transgression, but I think we learn something about ourselves when we realize I can rip off the hangnail. I have it in me to turn the lights switch off, you know, on or off on the Sabbath. I can bite into that tofu that is, you know, just over the lines of kosher. And I think, you know, that for me was one of 
those moments when I, I feel like it, 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 I remember the moment because it, it taught me something maybe about who I would become one day. You know, I love how you're framing it in such an empowering way, but I'm also stuck with that little girl that's just got this painful hangnail right. and she's been taught she needs to just suffer with the hangnail. And then if she pulls it off, how much guilt she's likely going to feel just for doing something that is pretty normal and actually alleviating of suffering, you know? Right. I mean, I think that idea of badness is something that, you know, shapes me. And I, you know, I'm curious if you, this is common across <laughs> religious communities, that feeling that it was so ingrained in me that, you know, if you observed, you were good. And, you know, to, to observe was to be loved. It was love love and goodness and observance were all tied together in one package. And so the good girls, you know, to be a good kid meant that you followed the religious rules as well as your parents' rules and the school rules. You know, to be good was to be offered all the rewards of family and community and approval. And, you know, the bad kids were the ones who didn't want to observe the rules in the same way. And, you know, one of the things that I wanted to write about in my book, one of the things I felt like was so important to me was to really investigate this question of what does it mean to be good? Because I found that, you know, the irony is that my name Tova means good in Hebrew. And so in some ways I couldn't have had a better or worse name, but it really defines that question of what happens when when you no longer identify with these rules of what goodness means, do you have to set, do you have to let go of that idea of being a good person? Are you bad? And that term badness, you know, oh, she's bad. That I felt like followed me on my path out. And I really had to wrestle and really ask myself, you know, is observance the same thing as goodness? You know, just because you observe these laws, are you a good person? And just because you don't, are you really a bad person? Is to really take apart those assumptions, but they're formed early on. Those messages are part of a religious upbringing in my experience. Yeah, that's, uh, that's certainly relevant and in some ways a tiny bit triggering for me and probably for many of us. Right, it is, because goodness, the idea of good, you know, that word is, you know, even my name, you know, sometimes I cringe at my name now because the idea of, you know, it's hammered into you. And, you know, for me as well, that idea has been enormously triggering, that sense of, you know, I can hear in my head still that voice, that internal critiquing religious voice that tells me that I am bad. And, you know, it's the voice that I fight against the most and that I hope people can fight against because it is, it's, it's embedded so early on. It sure is. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk about, uh, sexuality really quickly. Mm -hmm. What types of messages do children and teens get about sex and what are the rules uh, in orthodoxy around sexuality? Let's just it, 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 you know, Mormons, there's a huge issue around even an epidemic around pornography and masturbation, mm -hmm. but then there's also just normal teenage exploration of sex. W what was it like for, for you? Mm -hmm. So we were taught an idea that is the Hebrew term is Shomer Negia, which means like a guardian of the touch. And what Shomer Negia means is that any touching, any sexual contact until you're married is forbidden. And so a handshake is considered forbidden in, in the more right wing orthodox circles, certainly a hug. So any, any touching of boys for me was, you know, talk about what it means to be bad. That was as bad as you could be, you know, any, any physical contact. And so a bad girl was someone who was not shown Renegia, who did not, you know, who touched boys or vice versa. And so my whole teenage experience wrapped around this question of, were you good or were you bad? You know, did you touch boys or did you not? We were in a very small all-girls school and there were very few boys, so it made it very easy to be Shomer Nagia because there were no boys to be seen. But it was this intentional segregation of the sexes and anything co-ed was always fraught by this idea of, of touch and did you touch, did you not touch? And you know, for me, it created this internal sense of a police state. You know, oh, I hugged him. Oh, I'm very bad because I hugged him. And you know, I remember my, you know, when I was 18, I kissed my camp boyfriend. I thought I was, you know, I thought I was like as bad as you could possibly be. I was like, I am so, so bad. I am, you know, a terrible person for this very innocent 18, you know, as an 18 year old, and I'm talking about like as a 13 year old, you know, as an 18 year old having a first kiss in summer camp. 
and the idea that that sexuality, I think, is where those terms of goodness and badness were most loaded. And um, I think what it did for me was it created the notion of a secret second self. And so, you know, there were always these, you know, in my modern Orthodox world, I think this extends, I'm sure, not just in the modern Orthodox world, but in more strict communities as well. The sense that outwardly, of course, we would never touch. You know, no, not, you know, not me. I'm, you know, I'm good. I would never do that. But privately, it's a different story. And so the sense that anything sexual, in, you know, I don't even mean sex, like any kind of sexual contact had to be secretive. And you had to, there was a sense of shame always attached to it. And I grew up, you know, in college, um, I went to a secular college, but I was part of this very tight-knit Orthodox community. And so any any small, low-key sexual experimentation was cloaked in a sense of shame and secrecy. And it contributed to that sense of being bad, that, that there was no better way to be bad than to experiment sexually in any way. Do you have a sense that um, Orthodox Jewish teens would do something like masturbate or would, that, would it ever have even been discussed? So, ma so my masturbation was never discussed with the girls ever. Um, it was discussed with the boys. Um, it was considered a biblical prohibition against the spilling of seed was the term that was used. And so it was, you know, t taught that it was completely forbidden. You know, I would say that Orthodox Jewish teens are like teens everywhere and like people everywhere. And I I'm sure this is not upheld in any way, but I think the problem of it is that it again creates that sense of wrongdoing where the official rule is taught this is forbidden and yet someone's private experience is of course they are experimenting with this, of course they are doing this and so it steeps it in shame and it steeps it in a feeling of guilt and I, I think I think that is where the greatest damage is done this feeling that I'm doing something that's human I mean come on it's human but I have to feel bad about it because of religious teachings. And that, that to me is where people are, people's sense of selves are forced underground. And where we learn that we're, that parts of ourselves that we ourselves are forbidden in some ways that we are, you know, again, that we're bad. Yeah. Um, how, what would messages about women and let's just say feminism be like, in an Orthodox home growing up? What, what, yeah. Right, so I mean, in the modern Orthodox world, there was a notion that you could be an Orthodox feminist. I think as you move rightward, that would not be a notion, but I certainly grew up with the idea that I could be an Orthodox feminist. And what that meant was I could take the ideas of feminism and apply them to my Orthodoxy in some ways. And in the Orthodox, Jewish world, in the modern Orthodox Jewish world, there have been enormous changes in the past 30 or 40 years for women, where women have taken on a greater role. Like what? Men, well, so one aspect was for many generations, women were prohibited from Talmud study. Women were allowed to learn those parts of the law that applied directly to them. So for example, how to keep a kosher kitchen or how to run a home. But the actual debate of Jewish law and the Talmud was considered prohibited. And that has undergone an enormous sea change in the Orthodox community. You know, as you go really more towards the liberal edge of Orthodoxy, there have been, there's been a movement to ordain women as rabbis, which is not accepted by the vast majority of the Orthodox world. Um, a move to have women be deciders of Jewish law, to create prayer services, um, either special separate women's prayer services where women can lead the prayers. You know, in an Orthodox synagogue, men and women sit separately and men lead the prayers and, and have all public roles. So a move to change that. So that, that's one pocket of the Orthodox Jewish world. But those are movements, but that's not the reality of the lived Orthodox experience, right? Right. Those, those are, you know, when I was part of those movements, I thought that was like the mainstream. But, you know, when you're, it was, it's easy to, to forget that that's one small sliver of the Orthodox world. That's at the most liberal edge of Orthodoxy. So in, in traditional Orthodoxy, women, are, women and men are sitting separate. Only men are rabbis. Is that right? Yes. Men, read, men recite the prayers. Women are either, you know, a more liberal synagogue will have a side-by-side -side divider. So women are, you know, next to the men. Um, a more traditional synagogue would have women upstairs in a balcony or behind. But women would not play a public role in leading the prayer or being a rabbi or reading from the Torah scroll during the service. Okay, and then are women encouraged down a certain path generally and, and, and men, like girls, down one path and boys down a different path in terms of life choices? Well, I think for women, there's a very strong sense of family and marriage at a young age. You know, I, 
um, even being part of a modern Orthodox world and being in a secular college, I got engaged when I was 22 after 12 weeks of dating to my first real boyfriend. That's so, so Mormon. That is is so right? Mormon. <laughs> right. yeah. At the time, it seemed like, you know, maybe it was a little quick for my modern Orthodox world, but totally, like, totally fine. And the idea that, you know, you get married young. You know, for me, I, I think I was afraid of uncertainty. I was afraid of of not knowing what my life would look like. And marriage felt like a way to seal that in place. It felt like a way to please the sort of communal eyes of doing what I was supposed to do. But certainly young marriage and having children is um, part of it. And modern work, actually women have careers, women are professionals, and even in the right wing world as well. But the idea that family and marriage comes first, I think is central to the, Jew to the Orthodox world. Okay. Um, so are, are most Orthodox sort of mothers, stay-at-home moms then? I think there's a huge fluctuation. I think certainly in the modern Orthodox world, you probably find a similar spread to, um, to a secular world. Um, you know, part of it's just, um, in, the, in the right-wing Orthodox world, there's a notion of men engaging in full-time religious study while the women support them. So in those worlds, you actually have a, sort of an interesting phenomenon where the men are the ones who are somewhat less educated or less involved in a secular world because they are considered the ones who are obligated to study um, religious studies all day. And then the women go out and work and take care of the kids in order to support the men's study. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, I certainly feel like for all that people want to reframe and reshape Orthodox Judaism and make it sound more feminist, you know, certainly men are at the center of the Orthodox world. Sure. What, what are the messages around being gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender within orthodoxy in your lived experience? Right. I mean, growing up, you know, I think there has been a sea change, in, at least in the modern orthodox world around this issue. I think certainly growing up, there was a sense that it was forbidden. There was a biblical verse that was, you know, trotted out anytime anyone needed to prove that point. And it was just... You know, for me growing up, it was just one of the assumptions of the world. It was like, oh, right, that's just what, the, you know, the Torah says that. And part of taking ownership of your own beliefs is saying, well, do I actually think that? You know, what are the moral implications of what I'm presuming to believe in? I think, you know, my sense within the Orthodox world is that this issue has come into the forefront and forced people to reckon with what it means to be opposed to homosexuality and to have, you know, a tremendous sense of homophobia in a community. And I think that it's an issue on the table in the Orthodox Jewish world. And maybe it's part of the same way in the secular world where maybe at one point it was easy to pretend like, oh no, not, not in my family, no one I know. I think as people become more open, people are forced to realize this is all of our families. These are all of our children. These are all of us. And it forces people, I think, who maybe it's very easy in the abstract to say, oh, well, I'm sorry, but, you know, I'm Orthodox. This is forbidden by my law. You know, sorry, I, I can't accept this. To say that when it's in theory, when it's someone you know, when it's your child, it's very different. And I think maybe that has forced people to really reckon with this question. But it's certainly one of the hot button issues in the Orthodox world right now. Did you know any LGBT youth growing up or the people that you think back now might have been or that you suspected to be? It was so not talked about. It was just, you know, I grew up in, you know, I was born in 1972. So let's say the 80s were my, you know, young upbringing. And then, you know, not until I went to college, you know, growing up, it just never even entered my world. There was like a cousin who had a friend who he lived with who was male. And, you know, they were, you know, people would refer to him as, you know, their friends. And, you know, maybe people would say it with, you know, a question mark in their eyes, but it just wasn't part of my world. You didn't talk about I, it. I, I didn't even know to ask the question. 